There are mean things happening in this land. There are mean things happening in this land. Oh, those health care profits soar as we pay more and more. There are mean things happening in this land. There are mean things happening in this land. There are mean things happening in this land. Healthcare rates are on the rise. The sick and poor are left to die. There are mean things happening in this land. There are mean things happening in this land. There are mean things happening in this land. There go the healthcare millionaires. Debt and suffering everywhere. There are mean things happening in this land. There are mean things happening in this land. There are mean things happening in this land. Healthcare is a human right, and we won't give up the fight. There are mean things happening in this land. There'll be good things happening in this land. There'll be good things happening in this land. When the people take a stand and unite as a solid band, there'll be good things happening in this land. Welcome, everyone, to the People's Hearing on the Right to Healthcare, sponsored by the Vermont Workers Center. This event will feature closed captioning. To view the live transcript, click the button with three dots on the bottom right hand corner, then click view full transcript. If you need help, please email Keith at workerscenter.org. We're gathered today to hear from Vermont residents about access and affordability of healthcare. There are powerful storytellers in this movement, and they will speak truth to each other and to power tonight. We also welcome a number of public officials deeply involved with healthcare reform who are here to listen to the concerns of their constituents. Joining us from the Health and Welfare Committee are Chair Jenny Lyons and Senator Cheryl Hooker. From House Healthcare, we have Chair Bill Lippert, Vice Chair Ann Donahue, and Reps. Leslie Goldman and Lori Houghton. And we also welcome Robin Lunge from the Green Mountain Care Board. Thank you for joining us. I'm Julie Brisson, one of the co-coordinators of the Northeast Kingdom chapter of the Rant Workers Center. I joined the Healthcare as a Human Right campaign in 2018 after losing my platinum Blue Cross Blue Shield coverage when I couldn't work after ca catastrophic illness. I can't afford Medicare Part B, so I'm literally a charity case. Friends spent stimulus money on travel and furniture while I bought CPAP supplies and compression stocking, which would be covered if I had part B. I have financial assistance at the hospitals where my providers practice. So I'm beginning the annual process of begging for my health care. Dartmouth actually uses the word charity on their humiliating application. Healthcare is especially important now because I have breast cancer. No one in Vermont or the United States should have to be a charity case. That's why we need universal health care now. The program tonight will have three blocks of story sharing. Between them will be brief songs that you're welcome to sing along with on mute, especially if you sound like me, and a breakout session to give people a chance to get to know each other, uh, who get to know a few other people who are in the room tonight and to reflect on what we are hearing. Before our next group of stories, our first group of stories, I'm gonna pass it over to Ellen for a bit of context. Ellen? Thanks, Julie. Um, hi, everybody. Um, my name's Ellen Schwartz. I'm from Brattleboro, and I am one of the co-coordinators of the Wyndham County Organizing Committee of the Workers' Center and also of the policy team. Um, I'm old enough to qualify for Medicare, and I'm also old enough to remember the days before Medicare and Medicaid existed. They didn't just get magically 
ter um, ter signed into law back in 1965. It took years of organizing for the right to health care to get these public programs enacted. Today, I am the beneficiary of all that organizing by people who came before me. I also benefit from organizing by my union, which has enabled me as a retiree to have affordable, an affordable Medicare extension plan that covers some of what Medicare doesn't pay for. This makes a huge difference in my life and it's why I'm committed to organizing for a system where everyone can enjoy their human right to healthcare. Today, we're here to testify about how the healthcare crisis impacts our families and our communities. According to the Vermont Department of Health, rising healthcare costs force over 50,000 people to delay or skip medical care every year while one in three adults under the age of 65 are underinsured. In response to this crisis, this spring, the legislature voted to establish a task force on affordable, accessible healthcare to explore opportunities to make healthcare more affordable, including by expanding public healthcare programs. Unfortunately, plans for the task force to hold up to eight public hearings around the state were cut from the final version of the bill. Today, we're holding our own people's hearing, but we know that the stories shared today are just a drop in the bucket. We encourage the healthcare task force to hold its own public hearings as well. The denial of healthcare is a moral issue and a question of the values that guide our public policy. At the Vermont Worker Center, we believe that healthcare is a human right, something we all need to live our lives with dignity and which government is responsible for providing as a public good. Following international standards, we use a set of five principles to assess whether Vermont's healthcare system protects human rights and to guide us in taking action to secure those rights. These human rights principles, universality, equity, accountability, transparency, and participation offer a powerful tool for policymakers working to increase access to affordable health care. But we also know that realizing our right to health and advancing equity puts us directly at odds with the financial interests of UVM Health Network and other healthcare companies and asks big businesses and wealthy individuals to contribute their fair share to pay for health care. As we listen to the voices of community members, we hope that the healthcare task force, the Green Mountain Care Board and other decision makers will choose to value our rights and experiences over the short-term interests of the healthcare industry. I'm gonna pass it back to Julie now to get us started on the public testimony. Thanks, Ellen. We're going to launch the story share with six people who signed up at registration. First up is Wendy from Brattleboro with Abel on deck reading a Danielle from East Montpelier's story. Hi everybody, my name is Wendy and I live in Brattleboro. In May, I was approved for SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance. Starting this October, I will be forced to enroll in Medicare. Thus, instead of being on Medicaid, which is what I have now and has no premium, in a few months, I will have to pay $148 a month for my health insurance. My two main providers are not part of Medicare, so I can either upend the years of work I've done with them and take a chance on finding new providers and starting those crucial relationships from scratch, or I can pay my providers out of pocket. My doctor will cost me $160 per visit, and my therapist will cost me $70 per visit. This is, a this is a substantial increase in my medical costs, and I'm disabled, unable to work full time, and I live on a very modest fixed income. I'm really frightened I won't be able to afford my health care. Not having a unified universal health care system punishes everyone, because when we switch jobs or lose a job or become disabled or otherwise get forced onto a different insurance program, it often means disrupting the trusting relationships we've built with our doctors, nurse practitioners, therapists, and other providers. This is morally, ethically, medically, and fiscally offensive. We deserve better. Thank you. Um, 
Hi everyone, uh, my name is Abel Luna and I will be reading a message from Daniel who won't, uh, is not able to make it because he has to work some extra hours. Um, uh, so the message from Daniel uh, reads, um, Hi uh, everyone, my name is Daniel and I am a dairy farm worker here in, here in East Montpelier, Vermont. Uh, over the past, past few years, I have fallen ill to injuries and illnesses and was hospitalized for three days. My bill, uh, the, the total amount was $17,000 for three days in the hospital. I didn't know what to do. So the hospital helped uh, to cover some of the, the expenses, but I still had to pay thousands of dollars out of my packet, uh, which I still owe today to this day. For me, going to the doctor uh, was a hard choice to make because I had to choose between my family or my health. Uh, I don't earn enough money and the little money that I earn, I send back to my family uh, in Mexico who depends on me to eat and also for medical needs. Since that experience, uh, if I feel sick, I have to think about twice. I have to think twice about going to the doctor. So I choose not to go anymore because a visit to the doctor means thousands of dollars out of my pocket and um, away from my family too. I don't want to be in a situation anymore where I have to choose between my family or my health. I'm not rich. I'm barely getting by, and I also speak for the rest of my community as we uh, all don't have access to a health plan because of, of our simply document uh, that says uh, welcome to the United States. Um, also, if you get sick um, on a farm and you have to go to the doctor, there is a risk if you take the day off that you're gonna lose your job for uh, taking the day off. Um, and that is the other expense. Um, so either you choose to get, uh, to, to get medical help or to lose your job. So I'd rather pick up medicine uh, from the pharmacy and hope to get better. Uh, cows don't milk themselves. Uh, the cows have to be milked all day long. They don't wait for you um, or the bosses don't wait for you either. So we're here today in solidarity with, with everyone uh, because uh, uh, access to human right, uh, universal healthcare is a human right. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ashley Andrews and this is Sienna. Um, I live in White River Junction and I work at Vermont Homes where I am an advocate for zero energy affordable housing. I'm a mother of two. I have a seven-year-old daughter and a nine-month-old daughter. I raise my seven-year-old mostly by myself and despite all the work that I've done and advancements I've made to raise us out of poverty, healthcare is still not an option for me. I can't afford a vehicle to get to work, childcare so I can work, housing and food for my family, and healthcare. This is unacceptable. Despite working 40 to 45 hours a week my entire adult life, I've never been offered insurance by an employer. But because I work full time, I'm not eligible for Medicaid, unless I'm pregnant. In both of my pregnancies here in Vermont, I was covered under Dr. Dinosaur. While this did allow me to get the care I needed during my pregnancy and delivery, the overwhelming feeling that Vermont believes my unborn children deserve health care, but that the person bringing them into the world that will raise them does not, made me feel disposable. I am afraid every day that an unknown underlying condition, lack of preventative yeah. care, or an accident could put me into bankrupting debt or even worse, take me away from my children who need me. No parent should ever have these fears or live this reality, but too many of us do. This is why I am committed to the fight for Medicaid for all and the nonviolent Medicaid army. Hi, my name is Isha. I am a nurse at the University of Vermont Medical Center. Um, I currently work in the emergency department. I recently left a job as an inpatient nurse, um, so I can talk a little bit about both perspectives. I would say as an inpatient nurse, um, the biggest thing that I noticed um, that was a result of our current for-profit system is that um, patients who were planning for discharge and for placement in nursing homes or rehab facilities after um, being in the hospital for an extended period of time um, were limited in their choices um, to facilities that are understaffed and provide poor quality care for patients. 
Um, so while we're constantly told that our current system allows for choices, um, in fact, those choices are pretty similar. Um, they're really not choices. Um, and unfortunately, um, in my experience as a nurse, you watch patients, you watch families making choices about where to send their loved one, um, knowing that these facilities are not going to provide the care that their loved one um, needs. Now, as an emergency department nurse, um, we're constantly telling people in the end in our discharge instructions to follow up with your PCP, with your primary care provider. Um, of course, this, these aren't empty words. It's incredibly important to have that follow-up care. And unfortunately, I'm often informed by patients when I say that I don't have a PCP, I don't have anybody to follow up with. I recently took care of a patient who was cleared of an emergency, um, but the provider ordered extra testing because he did not have a PCP um, who was going to provide follow-up care and look into some of these potential issues um, as an outpatient. And this is something that you see again and again. <laughs> The lack of access to care is constantly visible, <clears throat> where we see patients experiencing exacerbations of chronic conditions that could have been managed more proactively, and as a result, our patients are sicker and sicker. Um, I know we all hear a lot about the mental health crisis, and that's incredibly evident working um, in the emergency department. Mental health care is not profitable, or current in our current system, it's not profitable, so we don't have enough facilities for people to go to. And any given day, we'll have 15 patients sitting in small rooms with um, so-called patient sitters just sitting there at computers watching them. Um, this environment is not therapeutic in any way. It's actually quite traumatizing. Um, and again, our system is making people sicker. We see the same patients over and over again. And most of those patients that we see repeatedly um, are either struggling with addiction, homelessness, um, or a general lack of resources. The emergency department is not a place that really is able to provide them with those resources, but that's the only place that they have to go. Thank you so much for sharing, Isha. If you could wrap up this thought so we can move on to the next person. Also feel free to finish up in the chat. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, no worries. You can move on. That's okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Erica Thompson, and I'm a single mom of three. When I was married, I had a Cadillac insurance through my husband's job. When we separated, I lost my insurance. I started the process to look for insurance. It was told I made too much money. After six months of paying out of pocket, an office staff at my doctor's office helped me apply for Vermont Medicaid, and I was able to get it for myself and my three children. But it still is a worry and a balancing act, because if I make just 200 over the income limit, I'll be dropped from Medicaid. But today I want to share about another hat I wear when it comes to Medicaid. I have been a home care provider for over 20 years for two people with disabilities. It is a job that I love and, have, and it has become very rewarding, but it's a 24-7 job. I should back up for a moment and just let you know Home providers are funded through a Medicaid waiver. So it's Medicaid money that comes in and is divided out among people with disabilities. The amount of money that they feel fair to do this job that I do is $45 a day. Only $45 a day to take care of someone's needs. I make meals, give meds, support at appointments, go shopping, do community activities. All, all of their cares are met by me. For whatever reason, neither of my roommates have little to no involvement with their families. So they are with me also on holidays and vacations. I receive no benefits. I have no health insurance, no retirement, no vacation, no long-term or short-term disability, not even any sick days. But as, I, but as I said, I love them and they've become part of my family. When I become frustrated with how little I'm paid, I remind myself the importance of being a home provider. Many people with disabilities would be placed in a group setting or even sadly would have to go back to um, the days of institutions. If it wasn't for people opening their homes, my roommates have a very fulfilling life where they are safe and can continue to, continue to grow and learn new skills. But the question is, how many people would do this for $46 a day? 
Thank you so much. And thanks to all the um, folks who just shared in our first round of story sharing. Um, I'm gonna kick it over to Tev and Liz to for a little musical inspiration. Thank you, Ellen. And thanks everybody who's who shared your story so far. That was really powerful and just re like really illuminating like the human uh, struggles uh, that are created by the healthcare system that we have um, that we don't need to have. So my name's Tev and her name is, I'm just testing to see how quickly we can pass Liz. Cool. I was like, are you talking to your kiddo or to me? I heard Rosa in the background. <laughs> Hi, I'm Liz. <laughs> um, and yeah, the song that we're going to sing um, for you uh, comes from the American labor movement um, from Florence Reese, I believe is the author, um, and comes out of the, the Harlan County coal strike in the 1930s. Um, and you'll probably recognize it, um, although we have updated the lyrics a little bit to go with our current situation, so. Can you hear me all right? Come all you working and poor people, good news to you I'll tell. We're the nonviolent Medicaid army and we're here to raise some hell. So which side are you on? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, people? Which side are you on? Meet our basic needs, 140 million. It's not because we're lazy, it's because of corporate greed. We're tired of broken promises. The rates are too damn high. Don't tell us we can't afford human rights. We see right through those lies. Which side are you on? 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 In all our 14 counties, there are no neutrals there you're either on the people's side or you're working for one care they profit off our sickness gamble with our lives us poor folks haven't got a chance unless we organize which side are you on which side are you on Join in with us, everybody. Unmute. Which side are you on? Which side are you on? We're on the people's side. Which side are you on? Hi, y'all. I'm Timbo. I live in Brookline. I'm a part of the Wyndham OC and base building team. Um, I have been on Medicaid um, previously a few years ago while I was going to grad school and it was just an amazing feeling of being supported um, by a medical community accepted and being able to get the care that I need without worrying um, and then when I graduated I got a job with the state of Massachusetts I lost my Medicaid coverage um, and I had a job through the state through my employer and it it wasn't that great and I had to pay a lot of um, a lot of expenses um, and in the end I wound up uh, losing that job partly due to the pandemic and now I'm unemployed so since then I've been trying to get back on Medicaid and so far I've been able to get on one of the qualified plans through MVP um, but I recently found out that I'm only about $50 away from getting Medicaid and I've been hanging off of this benefit cliff for at least five years and it's so frustrating. I just uh, went in to get some routine blood work at the beginning of this month and uh, learned I, I got a, a hospital bill um, like a week later showing that only one or two of the labs that I had done were covered as, um, as preventative care while all the others were covered as um, as diagnostic. 
Um, and this was something that I was new to. Um, and because my premium is not terribly high, it's, it's $1,100. However, $1,100 at this point could break me in the next couple months. And so dealing with this huge hospital bill, um, it just really frustrating. I wish that I could get back on Medicaid and I shouldn't be struggling so much, just $50 away from, from, from getting back on, on Medicaid. Um, we should really have Medicaid for everyone. Um, and that's what I've got. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Timbo. And Rhonda, you can unmute. You're next. And after Rhonda will be Ann Zimmerman. Yes, hi. I'm Rhonda Hall. I'm from Bowles Falls. I am disabled. I am on SSI disability. Thank God. But that took me seven times to try and they turned me down every time saying that I could work with epilepsy. Well, I finally got on it, but the big thing is I've been epileptic since I've been 13 and it hasn't been until 2016 when they come out with this Vegas nerve stimulator that my doctor was telling me about that could cut down my seizures or possibly stop them. And it's no bigger than a pacemaker. And um, it runs electronic shock up to your vagus nerve. And that goes up to your brain. And it can cut the seizures down or stop them. But this is over a $10,000 um, machine or battery that, the, that does this. And they do last nine to 10 years. There's um, my doctor put one in, replaced the first one that I had in 2015 and the battery, um, it has given me a life so I don't have to sleep every afternoon in bed and get up just long enough to have supper and then go back to bed at nine o'clock every night. This is the way I lived for over 20 years just to be able to deal with my epilepsy, I had to sleep. Well, now the VNS has given me finally a life that I can get up and do things. Um, it's the best thing I've done for my epilepsy, but my doctor is saying that now he's gonna have to replace the battery again. And it's only been five years. But the thing is we need to, you know, this, this VNS has given me a lot, and we healthcare should be a human right, and we need to keep this Medicaid going so that people do not have to suffer and keep for something that's a human right. And I lost my teeth, and due to my epilepsy, and I had to have them out, and I went over 20 years before. I could get dentures then. They're finally replacing 30 year old dentures, but I have to go through an agency that will flip the voucher for me. Now, if Medicaid would take care of that, which I asked them two years ago, and they said, no, we're not going to. No, we need Medicaid so nobody has to suffer like we all have been suffering. This is not right. Great, thanks, Rhonda. You're absolutely right about that. And I'm calling um, Ann Zimmerman next and Liz Medina on, um, who I hope I said your last name correctly, Liz, um, on stack. Okay. Hi, am I unmuted? You are. Oh, great. Okay, so I'm Ann, I'm from Guilford. Thanks to the Workers' Center for creating an opportunity for people like me to be heard. Um, my healthcare story is actually pretty simple. Um, I'm in my late 50s and I don't have any health insurance. I work at a retail bookstore, which is actually a really great and supportive environment. Um, we have some basic benefits, but unfortunately not healthcare. It's just too expensive. 
Um, my own journey is that after the Affordable Care Act became the law of the land, I briefly qualified for the Medicaid expansion because I was a low income single parent with two kids living at home. And that was the best health insurance coverage I've ever had. Um, sadly, a tiny raise eliminated my eligibility for Medicaid. Um, but while I still had kids at home as dependents, I was eligible for a pretty significant subsidy through the Affordable Care Act um, to purchase on the exchange. And between what the federal government kicked in and the state of Vermont kicked in, I could actually pay what most people would consider a very small premium for a decent silver plan. And the coverage wasn't as great as Medicaid. Um, and even tiny premiums were still significant to me because I struggled to keep my bills paid, but it was sort of manageable. And I did have the peace of mind of being able to access healthcare and go to the eye doctor regularly and such. Um, once my kids were grown, though, the premiums expected of me just became way more than I could reasonably afford. I mean, what am I supposed to do without? My car? My phone? I have not been able to figure that out. <laughs> so consequently, I haven't had any insurance for the last years. Um, and I have been very lucky in so far that I haven't had significant um, health care issues. Um, I, I do have, you know, I, I should be going to the doctor regularly at my age for checkups to make sure nothing's going amiss. I've just had two cousins uh, pass away from undiagnosed health um, problems that were basically the same age as me, and that is terrifying. And you know, we've just been through a pandemic, so wondering what I would do should I have um, gotten ill during the pandemic was terrifying. Um, and there's lots more to this. I'm sure that many people listening here today have their own nightmare stories about trying to deal with Vermont Health Connect. Um, to simplify as much as I can, one of my kids is living at home after college and is my dependent, but he, he, he doesn't earn enough to live on his own, um, but he's over 26, can't be on a plan with me, um, but because he's my dependent, I pay him on my taxes. Turns out that makes him ineligible to buy his own insurance. Anyway, um, why should we have this complicated, unwieldy, frustrating um, system that we have to give up on because it drives us insane? Why can't we have health care for everyone through a fair tax system? Um, I'm, I'm so done with this. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thanks, Anne. Um, Liz is next, and then Volney um, sharing Tammy's story. Thank you. Um, my name is Liz Medina. This past January, I became the executive director of Vermont State Labor Council, AFL-CIO. It's a very meaningful but demanding job. If I had been offered this job just a few years ago, I wouldn't have been able to take it. That's because I had stage four endometriosis and I lived with it for over 20 years. For 20 years, gynecologists told me to just get pregnant or take opiates to manage my pain. Then one evening in 2019, I suddenly experienced pain on my right abdomen like never before. I collapsed on the floor and my fiance had to drag me to the ER. They found an orange sized endometrioma or cyst on my right ovary. A laparoscopy was scheduled a few weeks later. During my first surgery, my gynecologist diagnosed me with the most severe stage of endometriosis stage four. This was an incomplete exploratory surgery that did not get rid of the endometriosis, but nonetheless left me with a $4,000 medical bill that I just paid off. So I had to get a second surgery and pay $10,000 upfront to get it. Fortunately, I managed to get the money, but that wasn't even enough. A few weeks after the surgery, I received a bill from my health insurance company, Blue Cross Blue Shield for $75,000. I cried. Fortunately, my surgeon and I fought my health insurance company and got Blue Cross Blue Shield to drop the charges. Today, I'm living a healthy, happy, productive life. I only wish I could have had this life 20 years ago. It was enough for me to navigate a sexist healthcare system that has little knowledge or concern for diseases that largely affect women. Being Repeatedly extorted by my health insurance company was downright frightening and exhausting. This system is immoral and cruel. It's also wasteful. My government and I lost out on potentially tens of thousands of dollars and lost taxes and wages because I was too sick to realize my full potential. Instead, our healthcare system uses our pain and suffering to make a few executives in the industry exorbitantly rich. We can do better. 
That's why I'm fighting for Medicaid for all. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Liz. Um, Volney, you're next. And I'm sorry, I lost. Uh, Heather is after Volney. Hey, everyone can hear me. So I'm Volney Gordon from Central Vermont, from Washington. But I'm reading for Tammy Menard, who's from Barrie, Vermont, who's honored to share their story with everyone here. <sighs> I'd like to share some stories from folks who have lived with me in the motel voucher system that relate to this healthcare as a human right campaign. Larry was diagnosed with a hernia before being housed in a motel. He has Medicaid with United Health, but when he goes to the emergency room, he doesn't have a primary care physician due to his uh, houseless situation. He is sent home with no relief from pain, surgery or medication. Colin has struggled with death, mental illness, and now houselessness. He has back issues and needs help with his anxiety and depression. He doesn't go to the hospital for help due to the treatment, of, to the treatment others have been given. Lack of respect and dignity for him as a human being adds to his anxiety, which furthers his spiral. Thomas calls an ambulance. He is in pain. They take him to the nearest hospital. He is told nothing is wrong with him. He is told he is, a, he is drug seeking and they tell him to leave the hospital. He only has on shorts, no coat, and is told to wait outside. There are no taxis in December. It's near zero in the middle of the night. He ends up walking to the motel. His girlfriend, Iris, has fallen twice at the motel where she went to the, ho um, <clears throat> she went to the hospital to make sure she didn't have a concussion. She was told she was drug seeking and sent home. No diagnosis, no treatment plan, and the next day she suffered the ramifications of a concussion. She was lectured about smoking, she doesn't, and treated like she wasn't worth anything. Another man dropped off at the motel after leaving Woodbridge for hip surgery, has hearing problems, which cause a barrier in communication. His neighbors at the motel noticed he wasn't able to properly get around and didn't have a walker. He wasn't able to leave his room for food and, they only, and he only had the clothes he came with. No one was seen coming to help him. How does someone fall through the cracks like this? There are hundreds of people who have similar stories and many were too scared to speak out. Folks don't wanna rock the boat or draw too much attention as their voucher could be snatched or they could be on the streets again. The motel management has the power to do that and social service, uh, service agencies that are in control of uh, where folks transition also have power over their destiny, creating a sense of fear on top of all the other emotions that uh, people have going. Uh, for them. Uh, anxiety, PTSD, depression, loneliness, despair, and physical hurt from not having their physical and psych uh, psychological needs met. Across all these stories, the need to stand out the most. Housing and healthcare are human rights. Great. So, Heather, I hope we can get back to you. I'm David Martin. I'm 76 and a half years old, and I'm lucky to be here. I'm lucky to be alive. In 2014, I had a heart attack. It developed a con uh, complication that was an aneurysm that is an aneurysm in my left ventricle. Um, how I got the heart attack, why I got the heart attack, basically bad luck. I was a poster boy for living, eating right, exercise, thin, but heroines that have So the doctor says it's genetic, bad luck. But I had the good luck to have really good health insurance. And that's why I'm still here alive. Why did I have this good luck? I was lucky to be born into a family, first of all, that, that uh, my father was a teacher. He had a steady job. He had good health insurance, thanks to the union. Um, the road was slightly paved for me. I could find my way to a job where you know, and I ended up being a teacher also. Not that I didn't work hard, but I know a lot of people who worked harder than me, who worked more jobs than me, who did not and do not have good health insurance. Um, so I am lucky in a lot of ways. And I think that possibly if a lot of the legislators or care board people or people who are listening to these testimonies think about themselves, they might have good health insurance partially because of good luck also. 
Um, and, and I'm glad you have good health insurance, but here's my take. Our health, that might be dependent on luck, good luck, bad luck. But our health insurance, our health care, that should not be dependent on luck at all. That should be a given. Just like when I was in high school and they taught me geometry, this is a given. Healthcare should be a given in this country. It's a given in many places in the world. And what is the matter with us? So thank you for letting me testify. I have to sign off. I have grandchildren who just came from Albuquerque. I haven't seen them for two years. So thank you for all your, your testimonies. Thank you, David, and good. Um, have a good evening with your family. And Heather, we're going to try to get you back in now. For me? I'm sorry, the computer went out. <laughs> yeah, no, it sounds like we can hear you now. OK, thank you. Uh, as I said, my name is Heather Pfaff. I'm 50 years old and currently moving, currently today, moving from Barton to Johnson. I have two grown daughters. Ariana and Raven, and I had to leave my job as an LNA back in 2009 uh, due to a back injury, a spinal injury. I have been a 24 seven only sole caregiver for my mother since 2011. She just became wheelchair bound in the last 48 hours. That's just part of what's going on right now. Uh, now, imagine this story, if you will, not being able to afford your health care premium because it falls one day before payday. You need your insulin, but your deductible is so high you can't afford it unless you borrow $91 from your child. Then the insurance company holds your insulin hostage until you now have to ask your child for two months of premium, $354 plus the $91 before you can get just one of your medications. Of those, that's just one medication out of 20. Of those 20 medications, at least five, you must stop every year until your deductible is met because the co-pays are so expensive. That's just one of many of the healthcare horrors that my journey has taken. And many of you don't need to imagine scenarios like that. You're living them as, as well. Decent, affordable healthcare should be available to more than just rich people. Better yet, healthcare needs to evolve as a right to healthcare for everyone. Thank you. Amen, Heather. <laughs> um, I am gonna call on Amy. Um, to read Tina's story, and then Zach, you're on deck after Amy. Hi, um, my name is Amy, and I'm reading this statement from Tina, who is living in one of the motels and received word yesterday that she has an extension um, but she's helping some other folks who are having to move out today. My name is Tina. Recently, I turned 57. I've been living in the housing system since December of 2019. And my goal is to eventually return to employment. I work with the ICANN program and voc rehab. I need income from employment to sustain stable housing. Once I receive a voucher and find an apartment, I do not receive SS, um, I'm sorry, once I receive a voucher and I find an um, apartment, I can then have more stable employment. I do not receive SSI, disability, unemployment, or general assistance cash. Lack of housing security is directly related to an increased need of people for healthcare services. This is what I'm currently seeing in the motels. The current hotel housed relocation process is a prime example of housing security negatively impacting people's health. The stress, uncertainty, and lack of information regarding housing created an increase of pressure. This is reflected in hotel guest health issues, symptoms, spiking, triggered condition episodes, emotional distress, and addiction issues. 
This is the houseless poor, a vulnerable population. The houseless poor have to fight our way from being invisible and voiceless, fight the outdated and fight the outdated stigmatization that we are not capable of participating in developing the processes, the rules, and the regulations that address our needs. We have to advocate for ourselves. That's what we do. We have the right to ask for clear, concise answers to where the first pool of money was spent and receive answers. We have the right to the same information with the current pool of money. Transparency and public access to request and receive public information is something that we need. Um, this lack of transparency is partly responsible for the snowball of effect in the current hotel housing crisis. And it's creating a negative impact on the health of the population that this money isn't intended to help. This increased needed services. This is increased, increased needed services for, to our healthcare providers. We are forced into housing insecurity and homelessness. At the this is a, the spirit and this is breaking many of us. This is your community and these are our people. Healthcare is a human right, housing is a human right. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Zach is next and Des is on stack, on deck. Hello, I'm Zach Andringa. I live in Dummerston, Vermont. I am a self-funded college student, fresh rescue coordinator at my local food shelf, a shelter advocate at a low barriers homeless shelter and an educator of adolescents in social and emotional learning while holding several part-time jobs instead of one full-time job, I have had difficulties finding affordable healthcare for myself. Uh, Vermont Health Connect seems to have technical difficulties every time I call, which continuously pushes back me finding a solution uh, for my situation. I'm currently in between insurances for the third time this year. Um, my day-to-day -day real life experience is more than I can process independently. Uh, unfortunately, my lapses in insurance make it incredibly difficult to have access to a therapist and to maintain continuity with them. I'm incredibly lucky uh, to have access to technology to expedite the process of finding healthcare, and I've experienced navig navigating these difficult systems if I ever find the time to do so. Unfortunately, not every person in the state of Vermont has access to technology. Not every person has the time and energy to navigate these systems. Not every person has an ounce of faith that those who control their ability to access healthcare truly care if they live or die. Through my jobs, I regularly meet folks who have been absolutely scorched by their lack of access to the resources that they need. Their natural resting place in regard to the healthcare system is ambivalence and disdain. Every human being deserves healthcare. Every day I see people remain in abusive relationships stay at a job that drains the soul out of them or intentionally live below the poverty line just to remain insured. If we did not have to put ourselves in unsavory conditions to simply be able to live, our quality of life would drastically improve. The opportunities to come to terms with and live with our traumas would be more abundant. The opportunity for us to delve into what our role in the world could be, what our God-given talents are, the pursuit of self-actualization would all be more plentiful. The pursuit of healthcare should not dampen one's ability to explore this magnificent world and take every opportunity that we desire. As a nation with such an abundance of wealth and resources, I pose the following question. Why are we not placing the quality of life and happiness higher on our list of priorities? Thank you, Zach. That was really, um, as Isha said, really beautiful and just powerful question. Um, and I lost track, Jess, who was, I can't find the, uh, who was next? Des is next and Patrick Flood is on deck. Thank you, Des and then Patrick. All right. Um, hi everyone. Can, can everyone hear me? I think, um, all right. Um, I'm Des, I'm from Burlington. I'm 35 years old and my story starts uh, about 15 years ago. I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. Um, which I had chemotherapy for, 
And then I eventually ended up having um, a total colectomy, which is I had my entire colon removed. I now have a J pouch and I'm considered disabled. Um, during that time, I actually had to switch insurance. Um, I was forced to go from Medicaid onto, I forget if it was Cigna or Aetna first, and then the University of Vermont switched their insurance and switched it to either Cigna or Aetna. So when they changed, they made me retry all of the medicines I had already taken, including ones that I was allergic to because it wasn't in their record. It was in the other insurance's record. Um, so my choices were, I had to either pay out of pocket for a medication I couldn't afford or try a different medication that I already knew I was allergic to. So I had to have an allergic reaction <laughs> and have my boyfriend bring me to the hospital in order for the insurance to even cover the medication that I actually needed. Um, and then when I had my total colectomy, they made me um, prove that I needed it. <laughs> I, and I had a perforated bowel, so it was emergency surgery. Um, and they made me go around to all of my doctors and get all of my medications. Um, list out my chemotherapy, which they don't actually do. So I had to have a nurse like sit with me and like write out all of the medications that they put into my chemotherapy. Um, all of this right after I had had a seven hour surgery to remove my colon. So I didn't even get to rest. I had my grandmother driving me around to different doctors trying to like get all of its paperwork. Sorry. Which they then lost repeatedly and I had to keep calling them. And then eventually someone at UVM just told me tell them you're gonna call the attorney general's office. And then I did that and literally while they were on the phone with me, they said, oh, we found it. <laughs> um, and I had to do it three times before they finally said they found it. Um, and then they just determined, it was a $65,000 surgery and they determined that my anesthesia was unnecessary. Um, so I had $4,500 that I had to pay out of pocket and I had to use the, um, patient assistance program at the hospital, which is another whole set of forms <laughs> that you have to fill out. So there's just no rest after you have something like that um, to recover. So I didn't even have time to go to physical therapy. So I'm still to this day working on my physical therapy from not being able to walk <laughs> after my surgery and go to my physical therapy on time. Um, and then today up to now, so I don't have a terminal ileum and I have to get B12 shots. Um, but the insurance only lets me have them once a month, but I actually need them every two weeks. Um, so my hair is turning white and I'm having nerve damage in my hands and stuff because I don't have B12. Um, the only place you can buy it in Vermont for yourself is in Colchester and no insurance companies will work with them because it's um, like a specialty fresh mix place. And so I can't get it from the pharmacy unless I want to pay lots of money or I have to get it from this place in Colchester that insurance doesn't cover or I have to go to my doctor once a month and get the shot and then try and take these tabs that don't really work because my blood doesn't absorb B12. Um, so that's where I'm at now for, for my personal giving, and it's not right and no one else should have to go through this. <laughs> that is so true and I'm so sorry that you have had to go through this and appreciate your vulnerability. Um, I'm gonna call on Patrick next and, um, sorry, I didn't see the name. The chat just goes by so fast, <laughs> sorry. Um, Jess, can you just say who's next? Cause uh, I- Tara, Tara Gregg. I'm not sure if I said that correctly, but sorry if I didn't. Thank you. So Patrick, you're up. Okay, thank you, Ellen. Um, I gotta say, it's very difficult to, to listen to these stories. Um, they're just terrible and shocking stories about our healthcare system. And it really does not serve so many of us. Uh, we can do better. Uh, the one comment I wanted to make was, um, and it's not a story about my own situation, but in this state, we are actually blessed to have a, a pretty robust system of federally qualified health centers thanks to uh, Bernie Sanders primarily. And there was a big expansion of the health centers uh, back when the ACA was passed, again, thanks to Bernie. And I, I really think the state of Vermont should pursue an expansion of the FQHC system because uh, it's, of course, it's a primarily a, a primary care uh, system, but they have begun to include um, counseling and drug treatment in what they offer as well. And they're truly a community-based 
system. Um, but they struggle too in terms of funding. And, it, and one of the biggest problems, of course, is finding primary care doctors, which is a big problem in this state. A couple of people have referred to it already. But I do think that, uh, and there are rules about how FQ FQHCs can expand. They need federal permission. But I do think the state should make a big push um, with the current Democratic administration in Washington and, and through Bernie Sanders' office to expand that because until we have a, a universal health care system that's affordable for everybody, um, the FQHCs remain one of the best sources of, of, of getting care because they have a sliding fee scale system and literally people who can't pay uh, can be covered um, in, in or through an FQHC um, because of the sliding fee scale. So I, I really and truly think our healthcare policymakers should be pursuing that and getting the care, at least the primary care to people that need it um, in the most affordable fashion available. Great, thank you, Patrick. Um, so Tara is gonna go next and then I'm gonna just check in with Jess about how many people we have left and whether we're gonna have time to do breakouts. So Tara, you're up. And I'm gonna pop in for a second. Yes, Julie. Just to oh. um, let everybody know there were over a hundred people with us, including um, some groups or folks that are at people's houses. And it's just amazing on a beautiful summer night. Um, these stories are that break your heart, but they make you wanna fight. So. Um, I just wanted to say 100 people, that's amazing and incredible. And to everybody speaking, you're so brave. It's not easy to go into personal details about your life. And I, we all honor you so much. Great, thank you, Julie. I, I just have to say, you know, being in this role, I feel like I'm calling on the next person and I'm just holding a lot of emotion as I am and trying to sort of keep the, the hearing going, but it is, as Julie said, it's just like, it's very emotional to hear um, all, this, all these experiences and much appreciation to the folks who are stepping up tonight. So um, Jess, do you wanna pop a couple more names in the chat and we'll just keep it going? Yeah, I'll just throw it on. It's um, Maggie Valens is next, followed by Susan Aronoff. Thanks. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. My name's Maggie and I'm a member of the Vermont Worker Center and a nurse in the emergency department at UVM with Isha. Um, so definitely can speak to a lot of what Isha talked about, um, but just wanted to kind of bring light on each and every day that we're there and we're taking care of people in our community. Um, it turns out that a lot of them have had to put their health care aside due to a lack of health insurance, um, especially over this last year with the pandemic, gaps in coverage have risen significantly as a result of soaring unemployment and it's cost millions across the country and thousands in our state, um, not only their wages, but also their workplace health benefits. And now more than ever, I'm seeing people come to the emergency department in crisis. Um, each and every day, I wish it was more days not, but every day really, um, we see people come in with heart attacks, strokes, respiratory failure, mental health crisis, and time and time again, I hear about how individuals don't have access to preventative and ongoing healthcare or can't afford their daily medications or are already in massive amounts of healthcare related debt as um, some people have already testified about and therefore put off their care. And a lot of people have put off their care additionally because of the pandemic and because of the fear of getting sick without health insurance as some individuals have also spoken to um, and and hearing people <laughs> putting that aside in order to make sure that they can put food on the table for their family 
um, is, is insane. It's insane that it's happening in our country um, and it stems directly from policy decisions um, to elevate profit over human life um, time and time again. So we demand the Vermont legislator, legislature to change the narrative and implement Act 48 and treat healthcare as a human right, finally. Thanks, Maggie. I'm gonna kick it to Susan and then Kimmy Hicks is up after Susan. Hi everyone, um, good evening. First of all, huge shout out and thank you to the Worker Center, Ellen, Manny, the Healthcare Committee. You got Kate, you, uh, Keith, you guys rock. Thank you so much for keeping the struggle and, and then the uh, push for healthcare alive in the state of Vermont. Um, I'm speaking tonight as me, myself and I, uh, not as, um, you know, I usually testify for an organization, um, but I'm just speaking for me as Susan Aronoff. I'm, um, I live in East Montpelier and- so you, Susan, you just got muted. Can you unmute yourself? There you Oops. go. Sorry about that. So um, my healthcare story, so as a lot of people have said, some of us have been uh, lucky in life and have health insurance. So I'm one of the lucky ones. I have health insurance. I work for the state of Vermont, but something really interesting happened to me this year. And that's what I wanna share. On May 11th, as a state employee, I received a letter from Blue Cross and Blue Shield and One Care Vermont saying, dear Susan, we're writing to let you know that Blue Cross and Blue Shield in Vermont and your employer are, here's the word, collaborating with One Care Vermont, uh, their statewide accountable care organization to improve the quality of my health care through a coordinated effort. Then it goes on to say that an ACO is a group of doctors, hospitals, and other health care providers who work together to provide high quality care and reduce costs. To learn more about One Care, I'm directed to this other sheet, which is the patient fact sheet. I have to confess as an aside, I'm a healthcare attorney. I've done healthcare law for about 30 years and I've read a lot of One Care's materials. So I was really thrilled to actually receive a patient fact sheet that I could use in my own advocacy because oh boy, is it a doozy. So Ann Donahue, Bill Lippert, and uh, Lori Houghton, Senator Lyons, if you're all there, you guys should look at this. Nowhere in this information sheet does it say that One Care what it is. It says One Care joins providers and communities together to improve the health of Vermonters and lower healthcare costs. It says in ACO, it says, what's an ACO? An ACO is a group of doctors, hospitals, and other healthcare providers who voluntarily work together to give coordinated high quality care to their patients. Nowhere. Does it say One Care is a corporation? You'd think there were a bunch of Boy Scouts volunteering. And nowhere does it say this is about a contract. It's a collaboration. <laughs> I'm sorry. So the word collaboration is used three times. And really, you can't opt out. You can opt out of providing information, but it's very confusing. We can't opt out. I'm now a cash cow. Thank you, State of Vermont. Thank you, Blue Cross and Blue Shield. I can't wait till the session begins again, because if this is the disclosure sheet, we got work to do. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Barb Wilson and I live in Charm, Vermont. In 2012, I was forced to retire at the age of 55. Six months after I retired, my company discontinued my healthcare benefits uh, for all retirees. I am now self-employed. For the past nine years, my husband and I have had to pay our health care coverage. We've had a front row seat on how much it costs and how much the increases have gone up since Catamount, which was a very reasonable program until now. Um, at the, the last year for both of us, um, we paid $15,000 in premiums and then a $5,400 deductible. From this firsthand experience and listening to the the so many heartbreaking stories this evening. I've come to realize that our US healthcare system has been set up for those of privilege and it's not considered a human right. We were fortunate in that we could pay for our healthcare insurance, but unfortunately there are so many who cannot. This is so unjust. 
Early last year, I did an analysis on how much Vermont taxpayers are paying to cover our state employees and educators. If my calculations are correct, the amount that we pay through our taxes represents 60% of the commercial insurance paid out in Vermont per year. I believe that we could cover everyone and still get come out ahead. Instead, we continue to place expensive band-aids on the problem by covering more of for some, but not all. We cannot afford to wait for our broken federal government to finally implement Medicare for all. Too much is at stake. I strongly recommend that as, as a state, we pass and implement H-276, which phases in Act 48 to finally treat healthcare as a human right. Thank you. Um, thanks, Barbara. And Dan, you're up next. Thank you. And thank you to all on this call that are working to, to bestow on all Vermonters among their most fundamental rights, including through Medicaid for all, the right to be healthy and heal, the right for services that will not only prevent them from ill health, but promote wellness and their ability to live their best possible lives. My name is Dan Toll. I live in Montpelier and I am a psychiatric survivor. I am here today as a voice for Vermonters with mental health conditions to declare their and my right to live a rich and full life with no distinction from those with such conditions. A life whose healthcare is determined and shaped by us, by peers, nothing about us without us. I was born and diagnosed, I was diagnosed with a major mood condition 25 years ago in the middle of a career in corporate finance. Six years ago, I retired and moved to Vermont. Here, I discovered peer, a peer, peer support group run by NAMI Vermont. Attending this group, tapping the power of peer, changed my life. My sustained recovery through peer support and it has enabled me not only to become a mental health and peer support advocate, but also a peer support worker and volunteer. In my advocacy work, I represent the voice of Vermonters with lived mental health experience on statewide committees. But as a peer operator and NAMI support group facilitator, I've, wit I've witnessed the transformation pow transformational power of people mutually and compassionately supporting people with similar lived experience of peers supporting peers. So my call to action, I wholeheartedly ask you to support the recommendations that are put forth in a June 25th letter to the Education Secretary, French and Mental Health Commissioner Squirrel from among others, the Vermont Family ne Network and Disability Rights Vermont. The letter, which I will provide to Vermont Workers Care to share, provides more detailed record uh, recommendations. But in summary, they state, act on the Department of Mental Health's 10-year plan action steps and work with community organizations to prioritize community-based services and peer support. In conclusion, I beseech you to support the letter's recommendation to recognize, support, and fund the power of peer and Medicaid for all. Thank you. Well, thanks, Dan. Um, Audrey is up next, and Bree is on deck after Audrey. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Audrey. I live in Craftsbury, Vermont, um, and I'm 19 years old. I've lived in Vermont my whole life, um, and I've been on Dr. Dinosaur for as long as I can remember. Um, I had a lot of teeth issues growing up and was so thankful to have you know, free health insurance through Dr. Dinosaur. Um, and uh, thankfully I was able to get braces and everything because it's considered preventative. Um, however, I had an adult tooth that didn't grow correctly and uh, they had to remove it. So I'm missing a tooth on my bottom jaw and in order to get it replaced, to get a permanent tooth there so that it doesn't close up, uh, it's considered cosmetic and it's not covered by Dr. Dinosaur or any health insurance that um, is available to me at this time. Um, also being a college student, especially going to a college out of state because it was better for me financially, I can't afford to pay for my school's health insurance. Um, it's $3,000 like a semester and that is not what I can afford and they still require you to have health insurance to be on campus. Um, with the pandemic, I was um, 
able to stay on Dr. Dinosaur, even though I am 19. However, with the um, state of emergency having been lifted, I don't know what's going to happen with my transitional health insurance at this point. Um, I'm kind of hoping I can stay on Vermont Medicaid um, because I am not making an income yet. Um, even though I will be in campus uh, in Massachusetts. And you know how much easier it would be if we just had universal health care, so this wasn't a worry and could uh, trans like transcend state lines. Um, however, I, <laughs> not yet, and I can't afford it. And so I, I just have to wear a retainer every day until I can get my jaw fixed. And um, just hoping that nothing really bad happens while I'm on campus. <laughs> so thank you all so much. Um, and it's been really lovely to hear everyone else's testimonies. So thank you. Okay, um, thanks, Audrey. Um, Brie is next. And on deck, I hope I'm not butchering your name, um, Yenda May. And if I'm saying your name wrong, uh, you can correct me when you introduce yourself. Uh, thank you. I, uh, I go by Bri, but don't worry about mispronouncing everybody says Brie. Um, I thank you for this forum and thank you to everyone who has shared. Um, I'm 48 years old. I live in Bellows Falls and I'm going to echo a few things that David said a few people back um, in that I, I've been very lucky um, with health insurance. At 35 years old, I was diagnosed with late stage colon cancer and I'm lucky to be alive. Um, I was married at the time. I had like a, you know, platinum health insurance plan through my husband's employer. And I remember uh, it was also around the time I got my first smartphone and a family member said to me, um, you know, it's great that you've worked hard and you have health insurance. And I thought, um, actually, I'm just lucky. I'm lucky. I, I, I'm married to someone who has a job with good health insurance. And um, my illness was more than a quarter million dollars. And I paid more for my smartphone that year um, than I paid for having uh, advanced cancer. And that was very lucky. And then um, uh, at 45, I was uh, single and employed and I had fairly good employer-based health insurance and I had a second cancer, a breast cancer. And um, that was from a routine mammogram. And I, you know, had that mammogram because I had good, good coverage and I went and did it and they found cancer. And um, because by then my health care was not as strong as 10 years earlier, um, I became a charity care patient. I, knew I had that I had to take care of through, and, uh, I was given charity care for that. So I'm just one of those people who just at a young age had some serious illnesses and, great coverage. I'm now on Medicaid. I'm unemployed and I don't know what's going to happen next. And that's, you know, uh, my story. And I just, this is just amazing that we can all share these stories. And I feel for everybody uh, who spoke before me. Thanks, Bri. And so do I, and for you as well. Um, and I'm going to call on Yenda May next. And Sierra is in the, um, on deck. On? Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Yendemi. And um, listening to the stories tonight, I have heard some of the same horrors that I've had to go through as well, uh, mostly in relation to those that are in the homeless and um, hotel voucher population. Um, just, you know, ways that I've been treated in healthcare, um, called a drug seeker and such. Um, I do, however, have Medicaid. Uh, for which I feel very fortunate. Um, I wanted to speak on behalf of my parents tonight. Uh, they married in 1975 at 19 and 21. And six months later, my mom was diagnosed with cancer for the first time. 
I was born to a mother who was unwell for the entirety of my childhood. And my father had needed to change jobs um, in the late 90s. And when he did so, mom's plethora of medications keeping her alive were dropped from his new insurance um, due to pre-existing condition. Uh, because my father worked 60 to 80 hours a week and had no children still living at home, uh, they did not qualify for Medicaid. Um, despite the fact that my mother's bills at one time had totaled in the millions. Um, my father panicked uh, that he would lose the love of his life, uh, made the gut-wrenching choice to steal from the company that he had been denied coverage for my mother. Um, so he could save her life by paying for the treatments that she does so desperately needed. Uh, my father, who had never had a record in the whole of his life, was now labeled a felon and lost his job. He struggled to find another job <clears throat> due to this new record. And when he did, he unfortunately, unfortunately encountered some of the same problems with the pre-existing condition clause, but there was nothing that could be done. He worked diligently, and when my mom called him home twice for him to help her, the boss told my father that she was a hypochondriac. My mother died six weeks later at the age of 55. Had she not been denied the treatment due to pre-existing condition, she may have lived longer. So that's why I feel that healthcare is a human right. Thanks for listening. Um, so thanks everybody for sharing. I had to come late, so I apologize for that. But the stories that I've heard so far um, are really heart-wrenching, really powerful. Um, so yes, thank you for that. Um, I wanted to share a story um, from a perspective of a healthcare provider. Um, again, my name is Sierra. I am a physical therapist um, at Central Vermont Medical Center, as well as a small sports medicine clinic um, in Essex. Now, I did want to share um, a story specifically about One Care, um, One Care Vermont. So one of the clinics that I work with, Central Vermont, um, they are affiliated with One Care. Um, the other clinic, the small clinic, um, is not. It's um, privately owned, it's very small. They do a lot of um, psych, um, sports psych, nutrition, personal training, um, kind of all of those together and, um, the clinic, and so I, I've heard recently that One Care claims that it does cost more for the state, um, it, but it by using this profit company, One Care, we um, get better healthcare, um, better services, that kind of thing. And I just wanted to share um, working in this smaller clinic that doesn't is not affiliated with One Care. We. Um, it's a 60 minute session for patients. Um, and I feel like as a provider, I am actually able to give them better quality care than at Central Vermont Medical Center where it's like 30 to 45 minute sessions and they're back to back to back to back with kind of little rest in between. Um, and at um, Central Vermont, um, although I, I do strive to give really good care and I feel that, that I, um, patients do get, get good quality care there, but the cost of a visit at Central Vermont Medical Center is about $300 per physical therapy visit. Um, whereas at the other clinic, it tends to be about $150, about half the cost for a longer session. Um, and so I just wanted to share that perspective on the cost and the quality and how really the quality of your care is probably more determined by the provider's experience, their training, um, and their support and, and environment that they work in, rather than um, a profitable company like One Care stepping in. Um, and so for me, as a one provider working in two different clinics, I can see that this clinic that does not, is not affiliated with One Care, I can actually give patients better quality care. Um, and I'm not saying that the length of the session is, has to do with One Care. Um, it may not, but One Care, um, the clinic that is affiliated with One Care costs so much more for patients than the other clinics. So I, I think the cost of the visit um, could be something to do with, with One Care. I also wanted to share my experience with health insurance companies in general, in that the clinic in, um, that's not affiliated with the hospital, the clinic I work, the smaller clinic I work in, I had to go and jump through all the 
the ropes of, um, of being credentialed with, um, as a healthcare provider with health insurance companies. Um, and it took uh, at a minimum about half a year to become credentialed. Um, and then it's a ton of paperwork, a huge process. Um, and then specifically with Aetna Insurance. Um, Sorry to I, interrupt, Sierra, we are at the two minutes. Please feel free oh, okay. to continue sharing in the chat. Okay, thanks. Okay, next we have Z Muhammad with Eliza on deck. Hi, my name is Z. My pronouns are they, them, Z. Uh, I'm a youth, uh, I'm 19, I live in Brattleboro. And I have Medicaid, but I've had issues with the insurance company directly and have not been able to get what I need with my insurance. Uh, I have mental health diagnoses and I've had bad reactions to numerous depression and anxiety medications in the past. And because of this, I need alternatives to pharmaceuticals. And unfortunately, Medicaid will not cover herbal or alternative medicines that I need aside from physical therapy. Um, and there's been many times that I've called insurance company and I'm on hold for hours and they have no information to answer my questions and they're just really not helpful. And they've also told me that they won't know if the things I need are going to be covered until after I receive what I need. So I may or may not be billed. Um, I also have experienced not getting my needs met directly at my doctor's office in my local hospital. Uh, my primary care provider is constantly sending me out of state uh, because there's no doctors or specialists in my town to give me basic health care I need, like an allergist. Um, which requires frequent transportation and gas costs. Um, and my primary care has been also making me jump through a bunch of hoops and making me do tasks and jobs that they're essentially supposed to do, which has been making it very complicated for me to fulfill requirements I need to get gender affirming surgery. Um, and at the local hospital, the ER has extreme is extremely short staffed and like to the point where they're not even really able to respond to emergencies and i've waited in the er for hours to get care for like dire need conditions when i'm in the er and i've recently i recently was in there and i got really angry and voiced my concerns uh and they threatened to forcibly remove me for trying to advocate for for myself to see a doctor while I was in the ER and needed help. But yeah, there just has to be better access to quality care and I don't wanna be discriminated against and I wanna get access to the medical things that I need. Hey everyone. Um, yeah, I wanna say thank you to everyone who's spoken. I have um, butterflies and tears and um, yeah, love in my heart from listening to all of this. Um, I am going to just talk a little bit about um, uh, having a kid um, when my husband and I had our first um, child three years ago. Um, it was at a time when his, we, I have insurance through his work. He's a high school teacher. And um, it was at a time when they were, <clears throat> it was really close to the time when um, Phil Scott had just kind of attacked the teachers and said, we're going to um, get rid of the teacher's Cadillac plans and make them pay more. And there was this whole rigmarole. So the um, teacher's uh, health care basically got um, kind of gutted and had to use a third party um, group uh, in order to get like to do the reimbursements, um, which basically just means somebody was sticking their hand in there and taking more money out basically. And so um, after the birth of our daughter, um, we got a bill in the mail for $15,000. Mm -hmm. And like, what? Uh, we weren't expecting that, we had no idea. Um, fortunately, we were in a position where we didn't have to worry about, you know, um, losing our house or our mortgage and they did figure things out. Um, but it wasn't in a timely manner, you know, it took months. And during that time, um, I know colleagues of his who are on life supporting medications um, 
for diabetes or um, CML, chronic myeloid leukemia, or um, asthma or anything like that, 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 that we're suddenly getting their $300,000, $400,000 bills in the mail for their medications, not able to, to get their life supporting medications that they take on a daily basis. So that's just a glaring example to me of how a system that is based on profit instead of life makes no sense at all. Thank you. My name is Opeyemi, people call me O, but my friends call me Dr. O. And I wanted to fill in the gaps with some little things. I'm a retired family doctor, 22 years in family medicine, 64 years old now, 15 years doing social services when I saw how bad the actual system was that I had signed up for. I'm concerned that here in Vermont, you already heard about the bureaucracy. Some of the smaller issues that I've experienced have been that I, a person who should know the way through the system, needed a navigator to get back on health insurance when I got behind using only my retirement um, social security, got behind and was like $500 behind and went without insurance rather than trying to prioritize that. That's not healthy. Number two, which was echoing what I heard somebody else say about alternatives, I use a naturopath. I'm happy that the state of Vermont considers that a, a primary care physician. But when I went to get herbal alternative therapies with cannabis, medical cannabis, the state decided that I didn't have the right, um, I was supposed to be seeing a therapist in order for, for my post-traumatic stress disorder. And what my naturopath wrote wasn't enough. This is guild related, G-U-I-L-D. I do many, many things that are self-care that are not recognized yet. And I think that it is really important that we understand that alternative therapies need to come forward with allopathic medicine if Vermont is going to lead the way. Bernie Sanders was well-intentioned, but I was there in 2007 and our system crashed when we tried to put um, the healthcare connector into effect. And we don't ever talk about that. So thank you very much for listening. I thank you everyone who's here tonight, um, both speaking and listening. Uh, I greatly appreciate your words and your holding this space. Uh, in my early 50s, with no prior history of problems, I suddenly had something very painful and scary happen with my heart. The, it's called pericarditis. And I was in and out of the ER and the doctor's offices for months. It was challenging enough dealing with the hospitalizations, the uncertainty, and the recovery. If I hadn't been covered through mass health at the time, I would have also faced many tens of thousands of dollars of bills I couldn't afford. I don't want anyone else who faces the vulnerability of a healthcare crisis to also have to worry about massive medical bills or bankruptcy on top of their medical condition. So uh, a lot of folks have spoken at, at length about their healthcare uh, stories, and I want to speak to the legislators who are here tonight. A few years ago, when I was in Montpelier lobbying for universal healthcare, I remember an influential legislator looking at me and acknowledging the moral rightness of our efforts, shrugging their so shoulders and saying, I wish we could do more, but... So for the legislators who are listening, I want, to, I want you to ask yourself in 2021 in the richest country in the history of the planet, how can we justify leaving anyone out of the system? How can we be satisfied with providing crumbs to another few percent of the tens of thousands who are left out every year, who are one medical crisis away from bankruptcy and devastation, as many have testified? So lest any of us think we have good insurance so we're safe, it's only a matter of time before the inhumanity and dysfunctionality of this system catches up to you or your loved ones. One of these days, you're likely to find yourself or someone you love caught in an insurance company loophole or denial of care, stuck with a serious illness waiting months for an appointment, or driving furiously through the winter night to the big regional hospital to try to save someone because all of the local rural hospitals were deemed not profitable enough and were shuttered. I'm sorry, but the apologies for glacially slow incremental reform are not enough. The solution isn't payment reform or a new fancy formula or an acronym 
that hides the dirty truth of continuing to exclude people from access to decent care. The solution isn't shoehorning another small slice of the population into a profit-driven, cruel system. The solution will only come when we transform our minds and hearts and truly consider healthcare a human right as it's regarded in most Western societies. Then the system we all need and deserve will be implemented. I'm asking you to be more imaginative, to find moral courage, to do something great, to consider that Vermont can be a leader nationally in establishing healthcare as a human right, not a quaint pipe dream or far off ideal. We will not rest until that day arrives. Thank you. First, just hear, hear, Manny, and legislators, please take his words and everyone's words to heart. So this is a story from way back in my history. After I graduated from high school, back in 1971, I spent several years working in a small factory where I made just a little above minimum wage and had no health insurance. I couldn't afford to go to the doctor. I needed dental work and I desperately needed an eye exam and new glasses. Then one day I got a letter from something called the Rand Foundation. They were doing a health insurance study. If I participated, I could get the medical, dental care I needed and even new glasses. I participated in that study for around two years and naively I thought surely this study would convince our government that universal health care would be a wonderful thing, the right thing, because it sure helped me. Well, as you may have noticed, I was wrong. We're alone in industrialized countries and not having some form of industry of sorry of universal health care. We're alone in the universal uh, it's been a long night in industrialized countries in the cruelty that we've heard about all night in all of these testimonies. Even here in Vermont, Act 48 was passed back in 2011, but we can't get it funded. Instead, we get one care. We get more, we get our money thrown toward more bureaucracy. We can't get Act 48 funded. We get told that it's not possible in spite of more than one good study having shown that it's possible for this little state to publicly fund healthcare for all. It's time to replace One Care with universal publicly funded healthcare for all. And legislators, you can do it. And as you can, as you heard tonight, you've got the backing of Vermonters if you do this. Thanks, Karen. And we're gonna close with Denise. Hi everyone. I have to change windows. Okay. I'm Denise Rixey from Essex Junction. Vermont. In November 2016, my husband suffered a heart attack one morning while getting ready for work. We were fortunate Essex Rescue arrived within seven minutes, did their assessment, and rushed him to UVM in Burlington. His hospital stay was short, but his recovery and three-month rehab program was a much longer struggle. He was very fortunate to have good health insurance benefits, time off work through his employer, and an amazing cardiac rehab program here in Vermont with Dr. Philip Adis. This has been a life-changing experience for both of us, but also made me think of all the Vermonters who live in rural areas so far from the nearest hospital and emergency services. They may not have the same chances for survival when timing becomes a matter of life and death. As I was caring for my husband through his recovery and rehab, 
I started having diff difficulties swallowing foods gradually with certain foods and then progressed to most foods. Although I had insurance through my husband's employer, I did not have a primary care physician at the time. I called my husband's physician's office since I was on his family plan, but was told as a new patient, it would be at least six weeks before I could even get in for a visit and could take months to schedule a physical. Um, I called another primary care provider and explained my situation. They scheduled an appointment for the following week. After my first visit, they scheduled a series of tests at UVM. I received my diagnosis for esophageal cancer within the same amount of time that I would still be waiting one more week to get in for a first visit with my husband's physician. I was fortunate to have found a primary care physician that was willing to accept new patients when a medical crisis occurred and did not have to wait, get, put me on a six month waiting list or a six week waiting list. Sorry, I lost my place. From June through July of 2016, I underwent chemo and radiation treatments five days a week, Monday through Friday for a period of six weeks. I also experienced anxiety on a daily basis and sought help through a UVM oncology counselor. I found out they, that anxiety and depression is very common in cancer patients, even when they have a great support system. I was fortunate to qualify for SSTA, um, Special Services Transportation Authority rides to and from my treatments at UVM, which was very much needed since my husband had already taken off so much time from work. It was on the SSTA where I rode alongside some of the most resilient Vermonters. My health, my health issues seem so small in comparison to the struggles and daily challenges of these courageous, that these courageous people face. One more thing, as I was on September, I had my surgery on September 23rd and looking at three months to um, recovery time, I was on a feeding tube and one of my neighbors um, was having a, a veteran was having a episode um, and thought he was being ambushed and emptied 17 bullets into my apartment building. One of them went into my bedroom window and through my wall to my closet. And I, and my recovery um, bedroom was turned into a crime scene. Um, when I my statement to the police detective was, I do not want this man to be treated as a criminal. I do not want him to go to jail. I just want him to get the health care he needs for his PTSD. There were so many stories that had been woven into mine. And this was, I wrote this in 2018 for another public hearing. And here it is, I'm coming up on five years in remission and we are still fighting the same fight. Thank you. Wow, um, we, we changed our schedule around a little bit so we could hear um, more people speak and before we wrap up our hearing, I wanna invite the people who have gathered at the Presbyterian Church in Barrie to lead us in a chant. Hey y'all, feel free to join in if you know it. <laughs> what do we want? Healthcare. Healthcare. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Healthcare. Healthcare. When do we want it? Now. now. What do we want? Healthcare. When do we want it? Now. now. What do we want? Healthcare. When do we want it? Now. Now. The people united will never be divided. The people 
Thank you so much, Central Vermont OC. I'm going to ask everybody to remute except me. Um, I I'm, I, I don't even really know what to say. I have some words written here. So I guess I'm going to try to go with that. Um, we've heard a lot of powerful testimonies this evening about how people around Vermont are affected by our current health care system. We want to thank everyone who has come tonight, including our public officials. We hope that our needs and experiences will help guide Vermont's health care reform initiatives and that this hearing will contribute to a more participatory decision-making process about the future of our healthcare system. As we emerge from the worst of the pandemic, one thing is certain, we won't go back. There are over 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country who are struggling with housing and unemployment while our healthcare system treats patients healthcare workers, and our health as commodities. It will take all of us working together to change our healthcare system to one that recognizes the dignity of all people and treats healthcare as a human right. If the pandemic has taught us anything, it is how necessary it is that we all get the care that we need. Vermont can do this. Let's finish the job laid out in Act 48. If you aren't already a part of the Vermont Workers Center, we invite you to get involved in building this movement. Check us out on the web, www.workerscenter.org or on Facebook, also the nonviolent Vermont Nonviolent Medicaid Army. Thanks again for joining us tonight, and we hope to see you at future events. What do we want? Health care. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Health care. When do we want it now? Good night, everybody. Feel free to take yourself off mute before we close the room. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, folks. Thank so wonderful to see you all. Great to see everybody. Uh, powerful so story. Everyone. Oh, God, we Thank changed our mind or got them thinking. Yes, Rhonda. <laughs> it would be nice. They can do it. They're just too lazy.